The city of Dubrovnik, historically known as Ragusa, for centuries a gem of the Mediterranean, one of today's fastest rising tourist hotspots, and 30 years ago the subject of a months long siege. Dubrovnik's medieval walls came under fire from modern artillery. But this action not only failed militarily, it became a turning point for international opinion of the Yugoslav Wars, becoming a visual representation of the conflict's indiscriminate nature. In the fall of 1991, Croatia had recently declared independence from the collapsing Yugoslav Federation. Slovenia had also recently become independent, with the remainder of the now Serb-dominated Yugoslav army still in control of Bosnia. Dubrovnik, part of the newly independent Croatia, was now an exclave separated by Bosnian Yugoslav territory. Serbia, led by Slobodan Milosevic, was determined to regain Dubrovnik for Belgrade. His Bosnian Serb clients, whose support would be necessary for such a move, agreed. As the mostly Serb Yugoslav army advanced, they torched and emptied the Bosnian Croat village of Ravno, near the Croatian border. On October 4th, the assault from this direction cut off the Adriatic Highway, effectively isolating Dubrovnik from the rest of Croatia. Attempting to envelop Dubrovnik, an even larger attack was mounted from the southeast. This was a combined arms assault, featuring naval and air forces in addition to infantry. On the first day of the assault, they captured the Croatian village of Konvale, part of the Dubrovnik exclave just southeast of the city. On the fifth, the first shelling took place of Dubrovnik, with the first airstrike following the next day. On the 16th, the combined arms assault from the southeast continued, with an amphibious landing staged to support the ground forces assault on Kavtat. The town was finally captured, giving the Serbs control of key heights directly across from Dubrovnik. The situation had now become a siege of the city, with the stage set for the campaign's most controversial events. On the 22nd, the Yugoslav Navy offshore began bombarding the hotel district, where many refugees from the countryside had taken shelter. During this time, Croatia began to extend peace feelers to Yugoslavia through Montenegro. However, Milosevic and Serbia refused to talk unless Croatia laid down the weapons they'd smuggled in to defend their nascent independent state. As such, the assault continued. A sustained artillery bombardment of the city began. This included shelling Dubrovnik's old town and its medieval walls, which past conquerors of the city, including Napoleon, had perhaps by chance avoided bombarding. A protest was lodged with the Yugoslav army by the American State Department over the continued shelling, both of the old town and refugee areas. With the war still in its embryonic stages, this was one of the first events that drew international outrage. The siege, however, was just just getting started. On the 24th, the ground forces advanced, further tightening the noose around the city. On the 31st, a humanitarian convoy of 29 vessels arrived off Dubrovnik. Important Croatian officials, including Stipe Mesic and Franjo Gregoric, were on board as well. The convoy was initially stopped by the Serb blockade force though eventually it was reluctantly allowed to deliver badly needed humanitarian supplies to the city. 2,000 refugees from the city then boarded the convoy for their evacuation. Once the humanitarian convoy was gone, the blockade was back in force, and bombardment of the city from land and sea resumed. Shelling continued throughout the first weeks of November. On the 19th, a tentative ceasefire was agreed to. This quickly fell apart, and on November 24th, the Yugoslav assault from the northwest resumed. Further atrocities and burning of villages had occurred in the wake of Yugoslav Serb advances. The Serb population, meanwhile, at least those who hadn't fled the fighting, now worked with the Yugoslav army to set up a client state, the Dalmatian Serb-led Dubrovnik Republic, headed by local lawyer Ako Apollonio. On December 2nd, the Serbs further stepped up their bombardment, targeting Dubrovnik's historic Old Town and its main pedestrian thoroughfare, the Plaza. Over 600 shells and 22 missiles were fired at the Old Town, resulting in 13 civilian deaths, the destruction of the Dubrovnik University Library, containing over 20,000 volumes of the city's centuries of history, and most nefariously later attacking the Libertas Hotel, where firefighters were setting up to prepare to battle the blazes. 
This brought on even more international condemnation, with both the Director General of UNESCO and Special Envoy of the UN Secretary General, American diplomat Cyrus Vance, lodging strong protests with the Yugoslav army. The continued bombardment of Dubrovnik, combined with the atrocities committed by both regular troops and Serb paramilitaries in the hinterland of the city, as well as the exposure to the world of further such behaviors elsewhere in Croatia during the simultaneous Battle of Vukovar, would help to build strong international sympathy for the lightly armed Croatia, while severely tarnishing the image of Serbia and its rump Yugoslav Federation. The Yugoslav army did issue an official apology for shelling the old town, and would sign a ceasefire on the 7th. As part of the fallout from the battles of Vukovar and Dubrovnik, on the 17th, the European Economic Community agreed to recognize the independence of Croatia early the next year. At the same time, Serbia was coming to the table over Croatia, mainly due to the threat of impending conflict in Bosnia. On January 2nd, the Sarajevo Agreement was signed, freezing most of the front lines between the Serbs and Croatians. However, Dubrovnik was not covered by the deal. Instead, the previous ceasefires remained in effect in this region, but the siege was unsustainable and one side or the other was going to have to give way. Part of the reason the agreement was signed was due to the expectation of an upcoming fight in Bosnia. To that end, the naval blockade of Dubrovnik was mostly lifted. On March 3rd, Bosnia declared its independence. At the same time, however, the Bosnian Serbs declared their own autonomous republic within the new state, also still playing host to the Yugoslav army. On April 6, they declared their own independence, commencing the expected Bosnian War, which would rage for the next three and a half years. On the 27th, the remainder of Yugoslavia itself, Serbia and Montenegro, would reorganize into a new federation. The Yugoslav army was still present in Dubrovnik, as well as in the neighboring Bosnian Serb lands. Despite the peace agreement covering the rest of Croatia, the Croats were now fighting nearby on behalf of Bosnia. Plus, the agreement had excluded Dubrovnik, which was instead, of course, covered by its own previous ceasefire. This allowed Croatia to advance in the Dubrovnik sector without worrying that it would disrupt the ceasefire elsewhere in the country. As such, when they launched an offensive, they not only recaptured much Bosnian territory, but also began to retake the Dubrovnik region itself. With the Dubrovnik ceasefire now obsolete, the Yugoslav Serb forces in Dubrovnik were transferred to Bosnian Serb control. The Dubrovnik Republic thus became part of the Bosnian Serb Republic. On the 21st, Croatia launched a major offensive to lift the siege of Dubrovnik. They advanced along the coast and by the 28th had reached the outskirts of the city. By June 7th, the siege had finally been broken, although the Serbs remained in control of the heights southeast of the city. The advances in the hinterland had come on behalf of Bosnia. This area was mainly populated by Bosnian Croats, and although remaining part of the Bosnian state to which Croatia was allied at the moment, they declared their own autonomous community within Bosnia on July 3rd. This would eventually become its own breakaway state as Croatia Croatian-Bosnian relations broke down the following year. But for now, Croatia and Bosnia remained allies and had re-established their land connection to Dubrovnik. The next objective was to eject the Bosnian Serbs from the rest of the Dalmatian coast. Their opportunity came on October 20th. As part of an agreement for the United Nations to demilitarize the area, any remaining Yugoslav army forces fighting on behalf of the Bosnian Serbs were either withdrawn to Yugoslav Montenegro or were transferred to the Bosnian Serb army itself. The UN representatives then arrived aboard Croatian police boats to enforce the demilitarization. As they docked at the port of Kavtat, they were fired upon by Bosnian Serb forces. The UN effort was aborted and Croatia prepared for a new offensive. In the early hours of the next morning, amphibious landings took place at Kavtat. Within two days, Croatia had recaptured the entirety of its Dubrovnik region. On November 1st, Croatian President Franjo Tudjman announced that all remaining fighting in the region had come to an end. That would fortunately remain the case in Dubrovnik throughout the remainder of the Yugoslav wars. However, a permanent scar has undoubtedly been left by the traumas the city experienced during the siege. Croatia would recapture the remainder of its lost regions in the summer of 1995, the same year the war in neighboring Bosnia was brought to an end. Dubrovnik would go on to re-establish itself, perhaps more so than ever before, as the jewel of Dalmatia and one of the premier destinations along the beautiful and historic Adriatic coast.
Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, make sure to hit the like button and leave a comment. It really helps out with the algorithm. For more content like this, check out our channel page and make sure you hit the subscribe and the bell button so you know when the next video is posted. Be sure to check out the project that forms the basis for these videos at apoliticalworldmap.org. And if you can, please sign up for our Patreon to keep the videos coming. Thanks again for watching. I'm Alex. I am out.